good morning or good afternoon or good evening whatever it is when you're watching this i hope you're doing well today i wanted to talk about a little bit more of a serious topic it's spiritual warfare and the devil oh my goodness it's so interesting to read the Bible very deeply and devotedly and come to understand the entire spiritual framework that it is proposing. And a lot of this stuff can't be tested in a certain way from a scientific place because it's about stuff that is not measurable. And science is entirely based on what you can see and measure, right? And so this idea of the devil and spiritual warfare, a lot of people are like, oh, they'll immediately get turned off because they may not feel it's, it's evidence-based or, you know, because science can't prove it, therefore it's not valid. But we have to recognize we're starting to talk about something that you can't measure. Like there's no ability or measurement tool that we have at this point in our civilization to measure spirits or bad energy or the power of good energy and blessings, right? None of that is measurable at this point. So I want to premise this conversation by mentioning that and Rec and also encouraging you to reflect on some of the ideas I'm going to pose and then just observe your life for a while. Maybe implement some prayer around this and just watch because you will start to see things. And although you can't measure it with some sort of device or although there's no like scientific journal on this stuff at this point, you will be able to see it from your own eyes and from your own experience and perspective. But with all of that said, I think it's, it's time we dive in. To start, I don't think it's crazy to acknowledge that there's evil in the world. Um, I think if, if anybody is even the slightest bit aware of the tensions and trauma that we as individuals have gone through and then recognizing stuff we might see in the media and other countries, it's obvious that there is some type of negative um, decision-making happening, right? There are people out there in the world that are choosing to engage in acts that bring harm or trial to other people and most of the time, it's based in some type of self-gratification or greed um, or, or self-aim that an individual is trying to impose on other people. Um, also, evil can happen just from straight ignorance and the environment that we're in. There is psychological research around this. A man, a psychologist named Philip Zimbardo um, he did the Stanford prison experiment. If you haven't heard about this, I highly recommend you look into it. I'm pretty sure there's a YouTube video on it that will explain everything, but I'm going to give you the highlights. Basically, he enrolled a bunch of students who volunteered to be a part of this experiment, and he was trying to understand power dynamics. And so part of these students were prisoners. The other part of the students were prison guards. And they were encouraged to fully play out their role, which whatever one that they were, they had, this was supposed to be like a multi-week extended experiment. And they ended up having to shut it down in three days because of the emotional, mental, and physical trauma that was starting to become inflicted. So the, the, Phil, Philip, Dr. Philip Zimbardo had to step in and literally stop it because it was getting too out of hand. And he wrote a paper on this and explained that what are, what leads to evil? And he used the Stanford experiment to explain and explore 
the varying degrees of influence on evil. Um, again, there's like seven points. There's a beautiful TED talk that he does on this. So I highly recommend you watch that entire TED talk if it's something that you're interested in knowing more about. But some of the biggest things that he pointed out was the power of environment, the power of choice, and the power of authority. Someone being over you telling you what you should and shouldn't do, and you surrendering to that authority rather than standing up to it. So again, environment, personal choice, and authority. There's like seven, I'm pretty positive there's like seven different points and layers of influence that he brings up. But um, I want to add, uh, there was also a research study done called um, the Milgram Experiment. And this was right after Hitler's reign and we were seeing a lot of fallout from the Holocaust. And so I don't remember who exactly initiated this research off the top of my head. Milgram, most likely, <laughs> but I, I could, I'd have to follow up and look that up to, to know for sure. But anyways, the Milgram experiment explored how could people do these torturous acts? And so he set up this board that had these buttons of voltage going from zero to 10. And he told an individual who was sitting in the chair and said, look, there's a person in the other room and they are, um, attached to the output of this electricity and I want you to ask them these questions and if they don't answer correctly then you have to click the button and every time that they get it wrong you have to actually increase the voltage and um there I don't remember the exact percentage but there was a overwhelming number of people who were willing to go to like the highest level of voltage and they were asking really basic questions like math questions color questions like it wasn't they weren't like mentally difficult right and uh, the other person in the other room I should add was not actually being electrocuted they were acting as if they were they have footage of this experiment happening and the people who were pressing the buttons had this guy in a lab coat overseeing them. And they were told that this was the administrator of the uh, experiment. And it was just a man in a lab coat. You know, he wasn't like some professional, you know, electrocutor or anything like that. But because there was this influence of authority over them, you know, you'd see these people sitting in the chair pushing the button. They're like, oh, this isn't right. Meh. <laughs> oh, this is this is terrible. Meh. So they know what they're doing is wrong, but they still went forward and did it. So anyways, the Milgram experiment. As you can tell, I get so excited talking about this stuff because I find it to be completely and utterly fascinating. What influences people's free will? Even if internally we don't feel like something is right, if there is some sort of external pressure and movement in that direction, we are going to be influenced by it. And th this is psychology. Now, talking about this idea of spiritual warfare, we have to acknowledge that there is some type of evil. And at this point, we can bring some level of definition to what that evil is. In the Bible, the, it's there's this figure and character, character described as the devil. And because of this type of description, a lot of people immediately assume that there is this external force outside of us that's trying to tempt us and sway us to do evil. Yet, there's also this discussion in the Bible of demon possession. And when you look at how the gospel discusses getting rid of demons, it is not by, you know, base, it's not by like putting force and specificity on the demon itself. Instead, the disciples and Jesus practiced focusing on the gospel. So it was about preaching truth. 
it was about the focus of truth and prayer. That was how these demons were eliminated. Now, if you apply this into the real world, it's kind of interesting to reflect on this, right? We have science that's telling us we have free will. Bible's telling us we have free will. Science is telling us that there's a huge power in environment and external influence on our free will. The Bible is echoing that, right? When they're, when they're talking truth and the gospel in a situation where there is evil, we're bringing a new environment. And that is what's going to get rid of this force, this evil force. So this concept of spiritual warfare, like on the package, a lot of people are like, oh yeah, you're afraid of the devil. And it's looked at as this real like woo-woo fear-based um, kind of perspective. Be but because of the, there's a lot of assumptions people make around it, right? They're not actually reading the Bible directly themselves or studying it. So there's these assumptions. Also, Christians, we are humans. And so sometimes we act out of a fear-based mentality. And we're humans, so our faith fails. We're humans, so we have moments that we don't realize that fear itself is taking us over when we start getting into these conversations about the devil and spiritual warfare. And then we go and talk to other humans who have no idea about these concepts and are not in a space of fear, nor do they want to be in a space of fear. And then this Christian comes off like, you need to pay attention to this. This is really important. This is like everything, right? We're fighting evil. You know, there's this level of intensity that's going to immediately turn people off. Anybody. So, non-Christians, remember Christians are humans. Christians, remember that you yourself are going to be overtaken with fear and have to confront your own ideas and concerns about spiritual warfare as you start to learn about this and study this. And for, and like, more than anything, does our faith in God have to rise above because we are not asked to be the eliminators of evil we are asked to pray that god may offer the opportunity of knowledge of truth to other people we are to pray uh first thessalonians five sixteen literally says rejoice always pray constantly and give thanks in everything you do this is god's will for you in jesus christ that's it. And so when you go and, and face this discussion of spiritual warfare, it's very easy to internalize this idea of, oh my gosh, I'm going to battle. I have to be a warrior for God. I have to make sure I bring truth to people. I'm only saying this because I know this from myself. My human nature is to be a fixer. If someone comes to me with a problem, I want to fix it. But Jesus teaches us to carry and be the person that another can cast their burdens onto because we are the ones that are practicing how to cast our burdens onto Jesus Christ. There are other people in the world that are not learning how to do that. And this is where, this is the calling of a Christian, is we are this middle ground between heaven and evil here on earth. We are the ones being called to integrate prayer and integrate focus on God when there might not be any. It doesn't mean we have to be the ones to bring our environment to truth. God's going to do that. It doesn't mean that we have to be the ones that bring individuals into truth. God is going to do that. We are simply the middle grounds through prayer. Again, rejoice always pray constantly, give thanks in everything. That's all we're meant to do. And it seems so simple. So those of us who are in that fixer mentality or who are not patient or who do not have as strong a faith in God as they might be called to grow, we're gonna feel like that's not enough. 
But there again, there's some other variables that we want to look at rather than just trying to convince and persuade and, and teach someone else about these um, thought processes and ideologies that are based in the Bible. So we can let go of this burden of bringing other people to truth. We do need to be aware, though. You know, the Bible says that essentially, and I'm not, I'm paraphrasing, you know, the Bible is lurking around and seeking who it should devour next. I believe that's in First Peter. And it, there's this, this depiction in multiple places of the Bible, you know, that the devil's prowling around, waiting, just waiting for opportunities. And as we reflect on what, what is the devil described as? What does the devil use? You know, and the Bible explains, uses anger, fear, sickness, greed, materialistic items, anger. These are things, envy. These are things the devil uses. So it's, in, it's, it's our mindset. It's our mental landscape that leaves us susceptible to this type of thinking. Resentment, doubt. We have control over those emotions in our mind. On a very practical reality, let's observe how this would play out. Let's say you're in a tension with an individual or a family member. They may hurt your feelings. Perhaps they have some sort of selfish, selfish intention or maybe it's just an entire miscommunication that we have yet to clarify. Either way, we're humans. When we're vulnerable, we can get hurt. So let's say we're hurt. Well, we can immediately go into this place of, you know, oh, this person disrespects me. This person doesn't understand me. This person wants to hurt me. That is a mental choice that we're making. And ultimately, we're leaving ourselves susceptible to this idea of the devil coming in and now causing disconnection. Not only are we disconnected from the person who is pulling this experience up out of us, but we're also completely disconnected from our relationship with God. By having doubt, resentment, fear, anger, bitterness, that's not trusting God. That's not having faith in God. That's not asking and being curious. How is God working in this situation? What is God's intention for me to be in this situation? Instead, it's our will, our survival, our self-preservation, which is exactly what we're called to let go of through the Bible. That, that is the exact thing we are called to release on the cross with Christ. That is the in, like the main <laughs> like staple teaching of Christianity <laughs> is to like let go of our own personal will and burdens, cast it on Jesus and and surrender to God's will for us. And be patient in that showing up. Okay, so practical application we choose this resentment bitterness we've now disconnected from god we've disconnected from people around us and this is essentially the definition of sin sin isn't a series of commandments as of the new testament sin is just anything that brings you to disconnection from god so you know here we are we're choosing sin by disconnecting from God, we open ourselves up to being susceptible to the devil coming in and evil filtrating our mind. But it's a choice. It is a choice and decision we are making. And most of the time, this choice is left to be subconscious. It is not intentional. It's our subconscious mind playing override. And when you look at, at a lot of this is defined as ego from a psychology standpoint. Ego is that sense of self. I, me, my, I, what I need, how I see the world. This is the egocentric perspective. And the ego is just a part of who we are as humans. 
And this is echoed in the Bible. Our default is sin. Our nature is sin. Our nature is disconnection from God, is what the Bible says. In psychology, our nature is ego. So these are very much in alignment, these concepts. They're just worded differently and posed differently. So how do we choose God in those moments? Rejoice always, pray constantly, and give thanks in everything. This is God's will for you through Jesus Christ. We're to pray, to ask, to go to God. Give me clarity, help me understand, help me see, and then be patient and trust and have faith that God will show you answers and give you answers in your life. So this is spiritual warfare. This is not something going on outside of us. A lot of people, they think, oh, this is spiritual warfare. Look at this evil outside of me and look at the bad decisions this other person is taking in their life. They want to point the finger outside of themselves and they don't realize that <laughs> the spiritual warfare, my friends, is happening in our own mind and perception. This is the spiritual battle that God and Jesus are talking about. We then, as we become accountable for the spiritual warfare within our own head, we can witness the truth. We finally see truth. We become united with God. This is what the entire New Testament really is a teaching of. How can we unite our human hearts with God fully? If you read the New Testament and you actually implement and actually practice it, that is what is being taught. We become pure vessels and instrument for, for God, to God, for God to work through in this world. What that means is we see truth. And the truth is not pretty. Uh, the prophet Amos has an amazing verse. I believe it's like Amos 5, but he says, you don't want God to come because God will shine the reality of everything in your face. And again, I'm paraphrasing. That's not exactly what he says. But he's basically saying, he's like, people do not want to see God because truth is hard. Truth is painful. We want to sit in our comforts of the materialistic world of buying the comfortable things, of not having discipline, of eating all the sweet, delicious food that tantalizes our mouth, watching all the exciting um, surface and worldly things that happen in front of us because the drama is enticing. We don't want that to go away on a very core level because it's harder, it's more work, there's more effort, there's more discipline, more accountability when you start seeing truth. So this is, this is the spiritual warfare that also happens as a Christian that you step into. Your heart unionizes with God and you start to see truth. And you have to remember, you're just witnessing God's battle of good and evil. This isn't our battle. Through prayer, we get to bring heaven down to earth. Through prayer, we get to ask and request God's presence. And this is a huge, huge, huge deal. The other day I heard a joke that really wonderfully explained God's relationship with suffering, pain, and evil in the world. So a man who was in ministry school went to the barber shop. And as he's getting his hair cut, the barber says, well, I don't know why you're going to ministry school. God isn't real. I mean, if God was real, you know, there would be, why, why would he allow suffering? Why would he allow all this pain in the world? And the minister didn't really say anything initially, you know, just kind of listened to him, finished getting his hair cut and left. And outside he saw a homeless man that was just really scruffy, you know, crazy hair. So he took that homeless man into the barber shop and he said, hey, barber, barbers must not exist because look at this man out on the street. Look at how he looks. So barbers must not exist. Otherwise, if they existed, this man wouldn't look like this. And the barber says, well, he didn't come and ask me. This is how God works. We have free will. 
God isn't going to just intervene into our lives without our request. That would not allow us to have free will if he did that. Because we would know for certain he exists, right? We wouldn't have to have faith. It'd be like the sun rising. <laughs> we know the sun is there. People are going to argue about whether or not we're the center of the world or, or center of the galaxy or whether the sun is. But bottom line, we know the sun exists because we see it, right? So if God shows up in our life, even when we don't ask, we're going to just know that he's just there. And our free will is non-existent at that point in time. So we have to ask. We have to request God's presence in our life and in specific situations. And this is the power of prayer. We get to bring this heavenly God and an incredibly blessing of an energy into situations where he's nowhere to be found. And it's through prayer. It's not through our physical existence in that space, although that can be powerful. But it's only powerful because in our mind, we've managed the spiritual warfare and we're choosing God. That's why our physical presence matters, right? So I hope this conversation on the devil and spiritual warfare gave you some things to consider and think about. And as a reminder, as always, this is an open conversation. I'm just sharing what I'm coming across because I'm trying to make sense of these ideas. Um, in the past, I had much more of a new age theological view of the world. And as I study Christianity, I'm bridging a lot of gaps in my own resistance and awareness and questions. And so I just want to share um, because it helps me process, but also because I'm sure that there's other people out there that are maybe trying to navigate some of these questions. In closing, I want to read a prayer from Ephesians 1-7, and I merged a few different translations of the Bible to get this, so I specifically merged, um, I believe that there's a little bit of ESV, English Standard Version, with CSB, Christian Standard Bible, and The Message, which is the paraphrased version of the Bible. So this is the prayer, Ephesians 1.17. I pray that God of our Lord Jesus Christ would give me the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of my heart are enlightened to know the hope of his calling, to grasp the immensity of his glorious way of life for his followers, and the utter extravagance of his work in us who trust him. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.